you very much and thank you for inviting me to Dublin. It's always a great place to be. Uh, I call this peak oil phase one starting 2005 and going on from that date. In the audience we have Colin Campbell who correctly predicted that 2005 would be the key year and I will show you more or less what happens. We're going to have to go through some of these rather quickly. We're Export, the key point I wish to get over is the idea that export availability is what determines the oil price. That is the oil that's available to be exported once the producing countries have taken their share for their own internal use. And what we see is since 2005 this in fact has been falling. It also accounts for various uh, geopolitical problems. So the, the fact that Egypt had an upheaval is not that surprising. That up, uh, Uzbekistan is pretty wobbly is not that surprising. Turkmenistan could be. The Argentines are having a fit of nationalism and have just expropriated YPF uh, from, from Repsol. Yemen we know is in trouble. Malaysia could be in trouble and Syria is certainly in trouble. So the oil is, is approximate cause of that. Now, if we just take the major North Sea producers, we find that collectively their consumption, the red line, has been absolutely flat, going nowhere, but their production has been falling pretty steadily. As a result, whereas they were offering the world 4 million barrels a day of exports at the start of the decade, we're already down to 1.5 and, and falling. Now, this, this is important because when, when an exporting country goes from exporting to importing, the Im its imports are a charge on the world system, if you like, and the people who aren't getting the exports that are no longer there is also a charge on the world system. So as the number of exporters, net exporters, goes down, you've got more and more demand on a smaller and smaller pie, and consequently the price goes up pretty rapidly. Now this is, this is production, uh, the industry is bedeviled by different definitions. Basically the blue line is everything that burns and can be used more or less as an oil substitute. And the green line is, is crude and lease condensate, which as you see has been on an absolutely flat plateau uh, since 2005, as Colin correctly predicted. This is the stuff that goes into refineries. If you haven't got any more of this stuff, you can't have any more refineries. So if you build a refinery in China, you're going to have to close one in Europe or the United States, or let throughputs go down to quite unprofitable levels. The things that have been going up with the NGLs of the biofuels, we won't worry about too much. Global consumption tends to tip down after big crises. <laughs> We're seeing some rather strange adjustments coming in, and some of these actually antedate the, the, the problem. These are all U.S. figures because the U.S. is much better at, um, uh, at identifying this. This is a terrifying one that in 2006, U.S. disposable income peaks has declined since. The number of vehicles on the road has, has seems to have stabilized for the last four or five years. The real GDP is found. So we're getting consequences of peak oil already, or this, this part of peak oil. Now, this is what the prices have done over the last, since 2000. And we've now got a reasonable explanation for every bit of this. The early part, the price simply hunts around. Supply is essentially adequate to people's requirements. The price stays at $25 or under. We then run out of, in this case, we ran out of OPEC spec capacity at the time around there, and we moved on to this tightening trend. It's quite a solid trend. This bit was associated with Saudi offering to put a lot of oil on the market and then not putting it on. And then this bit was because we went on believing that we could just pay higher prices and we didn't need to adapt. And of course there was no incremental supply, so eventually the thing went bang. It's worth remembering that the only people who buy crude oil are refiners. They buy it in the expectation of making a profit. Now, a lot of nonsense is talked about futures markets and speculators and the rest of it. They are essentially doing the equivalent of backing the 330 at new market. Backing the 330 at new market doesn't alter the outcome of the race, not normally. 
<laughs> it, may, it may, however, alter the, the degree of sentiment. If futures markets are very strong, the refiners may feel they've really got to get hold of that crude. They may bid it up higher than it might be. So there may be 10 or $20 of, of speculation right in that cap. Bit. Then we got into a strange Mexican standoff where there was too much oil on the market. OPEC didn't want to cut back. The oil companies didn't want to cut back. They, they stood st eyeballing each other. The price basically went down to the marginal cost of Canadian tar sand production. They didn't actually turn anything off because OPEC blinked. OPEC then started output cuts. The price started recovering. And in no time, it was back onto this tightening trend. We're now in this sort of danger zone where <coughs> we're fairly sure that if prices get much above this, our economies have real problems. We know if we can get it back to the other side, they start firing again. Uh, we've got this strange split between the US and European prices. Um, and so, so that's, that's where we are at this point. Uh, now, this I think is, is a key point. If we take the period since 2005 when things started getting difficult, we see that there was a huge demand increase outside Europe and North America, a rather limited supply increment, less than half the demand from this lot. So the only way supply and demand could balance is by North America and Europe actually reducing their consumption. So we've literally passed supply from the high per capita users to the lower per capita users. Now, whether this can go on or how far it can go on, we don't know. Now, pursuing, that just shows the oil companies peak. That just shows that OPEC doesn't have much spare capacity. That shows the, the linkage between prices and recessions. That's sort of an idea of the dependence of various. But if we want, that you will probably heard quite a lot recently about how American demand is falling and how its production is increasing. Well, people have been looking at a very narrow piece of that chart and drawing very excitable conclusions about how the world is safe. If we actually look over a longer period, yes, after a, a rather strange mid-decade bubble, American demand has come down. It's actually lower than it was at the start of the decade, but not a lot. And production is a little bit higher than it was at the start of the decade. So good news, but not that good news. Now, if we do a simple exercise, we take, treat South America as an island, and we say, what's the collective demand of all the South American countries? What's the collective production of the South American countries? And therefore, what have they got left for the rest of us? And the answer is this, that their demand has been increasing faster than their production has been increasing. And so the availability of net exports have been going down. And pretty solid line, no immediate sign that's about to change. If we look at the Middle East, much bigger and much more important, obviously, enough. But we see the same thing. We see a strong growth in their internal consumption. I've just aggregated the whole Middle East together. Production has actually gone up, but their available exports are actually below where they were in mid-decade. And if you look at Saudi Arabia, the mighty Saudi Arabia, it increased production by a million barrels a day last year. It increased it further going into this year, but its net exports are still lower than they were in 2005. Now that's a quite staggering idea. I've done the same treating Africa as an island, same thing. Obviously we had a big fall off in 2011 with Libya and Sudan not producing. But you're, you're, again, you're getting a, a similar pattern. So even if we restore Libya, which we will more or less have, it, it's likely that we have net exports that are smaller than they were in mid-decade. So have we got any good news? Well, it appears that the Central Asia and Russia demand is pretty flat, a little bit of increment at the end. Their, their supply had been going up pretty steadily, but there's some evidence that this is sort of starting to flatten out. And that, that also starts to look uh, 
slightly discouraging. So economics works, but not necessarily how we how we think it might, or how how uh, we hope it might. The rest of the people have, are involved in in sophisticated modelling to try and understand how how all these add up. I'm just here to pose a few of the questions, and so that's what I've done. And my own rather limited modelling, which just looks at the new projects coming on stream, suggests that. Yes, we, we notionally have a degree of spare capacity, a degree of slack, up till about 215, 216, and then on likely demand trends, it, it will disappear. So then you'll have nothing on the left-hand side in terms of increment, and any demand will have to be met by a rearrangement of who gets it. Um, this is sufficiently small that one geopolitical upheaval could, could remove it, so, so the, the, this point can easily move back to there. At this point, I'll thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully later I'll answer the questions.